Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first Titan U course of 2018. This one's entitled The Hitchhiker's Guide to Weather Models. We haven't yet actually done anything on models in Titan U, and this is our first foray into that. This course is not a nitty gritty how to read charts. You know, what is 500 millibars? What is 850 millibars? What is CAPE? That's coming later. This course is just kind of a theoretical overview of weather models and how you as a storm chaser or a storm spotter should be approaching them or could approach them. None of this is commands. It's all suggestion, all that. So with that said, I don't want this video to be 30 minutes. That's the intro. Let's get into the meat of this discussion. Okay, the very first thing we want to talk about is what is a weather model? Weather models are simply complex computer programs which simulate the atmosphere. There are predetermined variables which do this. Models are tools and they are not perfect. Simple as that. We don't have to, you know, spend too much time on that. That's the basic theoretical approach to models. So what data do weather models use? Well, those predetermined variables include satellite, radar, surface observations, upper air observations, basically any type of weather observations that a model can ingest, it does. It takes that in and then it begins its calculations. This data is the starting point. So again, it takes it in, it starts the calculations. Every model will do this a little differently. The calculations are gonna be slightly different. This results in better data sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Some models are biased. They'll have some outputs that will handle patterns better than others. You see this all the time, and that's why over time you'll develop your own favorite model to look at. Okay, this is the old adage. We're gonna talk about this very briefly. Garbage in, garbage out. If you get really bad starting data, say there's data missing or you get some erroneous data, any number of things, you see this oftentimes in the spring, you have to take this into account. If you get bad data in, you're going to get bad output. You're not going to get an accurate representation. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at models, okay? Okay, so what is a weather model? There's two main types that we will be delving into global models and regional models global models well they're exactly what they sound like they predict weather for the whole globe i know crazy right regional models only predict weather for regions of the globe so you know just very little sections you know they're usually local models that's something like that global models things examples would be like the gfs the euro ecm wf those are global models they look at the whole globe and they model the globe and weather patterns throughout the globe, okay? Regional models, they'd be like the NAM and the HER or HRRR, there's the big debate. We should have a tight new course on which pronouncement is best, but uh, regional models are definitely, they ran over just certain regions, like the NAM's only really for North America, HRRR, same thing, they're American models, so yeah, there you go. Model resolution, not all models run at the same resolution. What is resolution? It's how much detail you get, how tightly packed the model is simulating the atmosphere. This is usually, we talk about it in kilometers. Global models have larger resolutions, like 12 kilometers or more. That means it's simulating the atmosphere in 12 kilometer pockets. So basically, I guess the best way to describe that is that you're not getting like storm scale kind of uh, calculations at 12 kilometers. You're getting more broad scale. So when it's uh, models popping out storms and such, it's not popping out individual storms at 12 kilometers. It's popping out, you know, there's going to be precipitation in this area, to put it in layman's terms, but we don't know what it's going to be, et cetera. Regional models, on the other hand, they can be anything from 12 kilometers, something like the 12 kilometer NAM, all the way down to one kilometer. There's actually a one kilometer NAM that runs every now and then in a storm region. It's actually a fire weather nest, but that one kilometer model actually is very high resolution, obviously would model individual storms in that, re in that respect. So, the less fine models at 12 kilometer, what are we, why would you want a model that doesn't have fine detail? Well, first off, these are going to be able to run days in the future. We don't have the computing power to run a one kilometer model 15 days out. That would be, uh, that would be a lot. That one day that will happen, but not today. So they're able to see days in the future. So if you're wanting to see, hey, is there going to be a pattern a week out with severe weather? A 12 kilometer model is what you're going to be looking at for that typically. You're, it's, these are beneficial to see those large scale trends. They're also beneficial if you don't want to get mired into too much detail and you want to keep your common sense forecasting going. 
there there is some merit to this where you don't look at where individual storms are going to form on something like the HRRR, which may change every hour, but you can kind of keep a good generalized view of, hey, this is where the dry line's at. And because that dry line is here and there's a bulge, that's a good indication because of my pattern recognition that there's going to be storms here. So, but these less fine models can run anywhere from three to 15 days into the future. And they're great for that. Just, I mean, just great for a bin we'll see out in the future. Now, high res models, there's a lot more detail. See that image on the right? See how much more detail there is on the temperature map? I'll go back and forth. See, these are taken at the same time. You can see, you know, they look similar, but there's a lot more detail down to, you know, three kilometers or one kilometer or whatever. So these are better for predicting for storm chasing individual storm cells. Like there's going to be a storm forming in Woods County later today. I mean, it, it, the HRRR has been showing it for six runs now. So is the three kilometer NAM. So is the uh, Wharf from Texas Tech. They're all showing Woods County. Well, a high res model is really going to hit at that a lot better than those uh, lower res models. Uh, but I guess buyer beware. A storm doesn't mean it's the storm on these models. Sometimes they'll pop out a storm. Uh, the most famous case I can think of, recent case, would be the Easter day last year where the HRRR or her was firing uh, a big supercell in the Texas panhandle and not really much along this outflow boundary in northwest Oklahoma. This is like the greatest example of not trusting a high res model because those supercells in the panhandle, they were robust, they were there, they did happen, but they weren't in an environment that actually supported tornadoes that well while the storm on the outflow boundary formed. Models didn't handle it well, but a storm formed. It was an environment that was great for tornadoes, and it happened. So you got to use more than just models. We'll get to that in a second, though. Model accuracy. Models, they're both accurate and not all that accurate. That, that's a weird contradiction and dichotomy, but it's true. The accuracy depends on how you use models. If you take them verbatim versus applying some skill behind their output, you're not going to get very accurate results. For instance, if the GFS throws out a massive severe weather day 10 days out and no other model is, and you just latch onto that and say big severe weather outbreak in 10 days and you get the, you could get to that day and it could be sunny and nice or even cold, whatever. You have to have some skill. You have to know how to use models for this. Models are a tool to find the answer, but they are not the answer themselves. That is like the key approach to models. They are a tool. They are part of your forecasting repertoire as a chaser or a spotter or emergency management personnel, but they are not the answer themselves. Models have improved over time. When I started chasing in 2003, models were, they were there and they were sometimes pretty good, but they were just, they were a very unreliable tool at times, but they have improved dramatically since then. I mean, it is amazing how much better models are today. Modeling sites are way better. COD, I'm using their graphics here. You should donate to them. You should support them. They have an amazing interface for modeling. And this was not the case for most places back in 2003. Things are happening and it's good. And there's more modeling improvements coming soon. There's a lot, There's some really good short-term modeling that the National Weather Service is working on. There's also improvements to, to things like the GFS and the HRRR. There's a lot of great things coming. Okay, let's get back to models and discussing them because they're not perfect. Remember the, about that garbage in, garbage out. You got to check it. You got to always be on the lookout. They are not perfect. They can be used wrong. Models are best used with friends. By that, I mean it's best to use more than one model to make a forecast. Don't just use one. They're also best to be used with observational data, etc., to kind of fine tune a forecast. Okay, so let's get to a practical level. How do we approach models in chasing? If you are chasing today, what are you looking for? How do you approach a model? A model showing this beautiful output, do you believe it, why, etc.? Okay, I got three rules for this. Models are a tool amongst many. That's rule number one, remember that. Also rule number two, always start your forecast with the here and now. And then rule number three is never trust the model. Let's dive into each of these rules. Rule number one, a model is one of many tools, like the satellite image, again from COD, amazing site. Donate, visit, be a part of the action. Models are just one of the many tools to make a target forecast. 
with that in mind. You want to be doing things like looking at satellite, looking at surface observations. We have a course on storm chase targeting that handles a lot of this. You should check it out. It has a lot of good information in it. You should never trust a single model, single run of a model blindly. That is so important. If the HRRR finally gives you your storm and it's a beautiful storm on the HRRR and it's exactly what you want, remember rule three that we're going to get to. Always take a full suite of data into consideration. Models may not handle the cap well. They may not initialize well with surface observations. You always have to make sure that when it comes to the many tools you use, that they're all kind of working toward the same solution. You don't want to, if you have a bunch of data that's not working with each other, you know, a model says there's going to be storms, but observational data says the cap's thermonuclear. You got a pretty good indication that one or the other is going to be wrong. Observational data, for the record, is almost always right. Just, just so you know. Rule number two, start in the here and now. Again, back to that dang observational data, surface ops, satellite, radar. They are the ultimate what is happening data you can get your hands on. You, can, you don't have to doubt this. Very rarely does observational data let you down. You check out and you, if you check how a model is initializing versus what is actually going on, it is invaluable. It lets you spot errors and biases. For storm chasing, the number one thing you're going to be looking at is moisture and seeing if a model is actually correctly modeling the moisture right. Oftentimes, you're going to get funky things where one, such as the three kilometer NAM, is way overdoing moisture by five or six degrees and it's forming storms against a strong cap. When you see that moisture is going to be way less, the cap's still very strong, you know storms are going to form. That happens often in the spring. You always have to be checking. Um, you got to see what's going on now. That results in a better understanding of what will happen again. The same moisture and the cap are just two very big things storm chasers are going to be dealing with when it comes to models. If a model is overdoing moisture, it's going to tend to fire more storms than are what is actually going to happen. That's a general rule. Very rarely will you get less moisture than forecast and more storms than the model's putting out. I mean, it's just, that's very rare to have happen. Sometimes models, they don't handle morning conditions well or storm evolution well in the morning. So you got to fact check. Uh, oftentimes a model, I, I can think of many, many times when you do not get a model pumping out the right storm at the right time or morning convection isn't handled well. Usually this is the higher risk days too when models really let you down on this when you think, oh, uh, we, we're going to have beautiful isolated supercells later in the day, tons of them, tons of tornadoes, and by mid-morning there's literally storms all over your target area. That's because models sometimes don't handle that evolution well. They're getting better, but... You always need to be keeping this in mind. Never trust models. They're liars. They are just liars, liars, liars. They'll lie to you so many times. You should never blindly believe model output, especially one run of one model. Now, if my general rule, and we'll get to a little bit more pro tips in a bit, is that if all models are saying something, good bet it's probably going to happen in some form of that truth. Always approach models with a skeptical nature and apply good old common sense to chase forecasting to the situation at hand as well. You know, pattern recognition is so important. You get way better at it the more you chase. It's just how things work. So uh, at first, you may not have very good pattern recognition skills. Trust me, they do come with time. Here's a few more tips. Models are not all seeing can be an error. So again, remember, models can be liars. Don't just trust them. I mean... It's just like if someone comes up to you and tells you I got a way to get you a million dollars right now, you don't just go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. You go, hmm, sounds a little fishy. Do that with models, seriously. Uh, learn the big picture and small picture meteorology for chase forecasts and know what should be so you can fact check models on the fly. Uh, a good way to say this is, again, let's go back to the dew point and cap thing. If the dew points are registering higher in the models than what they actually are, you know storms are going to be easier to break the cap on that model, which means it's probably not how things are going to go. Worth worth remembering. You just always got to build a, you got to have that knowledge, that background knowledge and meteorology for your chase forecast to be able to fact check models on the fly. And models are what could be, but never are they what will be. They should never be looked at like that. What could be is what a model does, not what could, what will be, okay? So just remember, what could be is a model, not what will be. 
Okay, so when it comes to my personal workflow on for storm chasing and models, I first start with those observations just because it gives me a good understanding of where we're at. I'll typically, for an Oklahoma chase, for instance, I'll check out the mesonet. I'll then check out the 12Z sounding from the uh, H, or not the H but just the 12Z sounding from OUN. I'm sitting here reading ahead. And then I will dive into, or I'll look at satellite and radar, obviously. Then I'll dive into the three kilometer NAM, HRRR, the Texas Tech Wharf, that's my favorite local wharf, and the Euro. This year, I'm also excited about the SRAF from the SBC, but I don't know how it's going to work. We might have a tutorial on that as we get a handle on it. But I'll look at a combination of high res models for Chase Morning. I am someone that does not typically look at the 12 kilometer NAM or the GFS. Just because, first off, I have never looked at the GFS the morning of a chase. I just have never liked it for a short-term chase forecast. I don't know why. I think it's just because I don't feel like it's very accurate the morning of chases. Uh, and the 12-kilometer now, I just I think it's kind of silly to look at it when you have a 3-kilometer model that runs. Yeah, so anyways, people, people will disagree with that approach. Some will agree. It's just everyone has their preferences. I try to average solutions from several models and spot trends. The trend is your friend, usually. So for instance, what I mean by that is if a model is constantly pumping out uh, storms, but it's been waning for three straight runs from six storms to three storms to two storms, that means the model has caught on to something and it's caught on to an environment that's less favorable for storms, that's a trend. And if, say, you do that and then you get this special, you get the 0Z run of the NAM, you're looking for 0 to 1Z initiation, which I guess this the timing on that doesn't work out, but let's just say that something like that happens where you get a second model and it shows suddenly shows no storms where it had been showing some six hours before. Really good bet that the trend has worked against you, that trend has been showing it, and you won't get storms. Just how, it, I mean, the trend is your friend. That's just how it works. Uh, one run of one model is rarely enough to get me out of the door. So if I'm looking at the HRRR and it's been showing no storms all day and then suddenly at 20Z, there's a big supercell that's pumping out uh, six counties west of me. So I'm gonna wait for the 21Z model. I'm gonna say I may be late. This is probably a mistake, but I'm gonna wait and see if it gives me a storm as well. But you can bet your bottom dollar, I may not be out the door and on the road, but I will be packing my car if I see that just because I like to be ready to go at a moment's notice. Failure is the greatest teacher. Uh, you're going to fail a lot in storm chasing. It happens. You're going to mess up days. Do not, I guess the best way to put it, don't just gloss over those and don't, you know, you got to go back and look. You got to see what did I see? Why did I make these decisions? And what did I miss? that what did I miss will improve you every time. So remember, always, always, always be humble and be willing to teach yourself from your failures. So that's my theoretical look at modeling and how to approach it for storm chasers. I'm interested in any questions you have. Be sure to use the comments to do that. And uh, if you have any suggestions for future Titan U courses, put those in the comments as well. We'll see you next time.